Welcome to Behind the Music, the Houston Chamber Choir's weekly podcast. I'm Sinjin Flynn. This time, our guest is Mark Buller, a Houston-based composer who has worked with the Houston Chamber Choir on a number of occasions, Mark. Isn't that That's so? Right. That's right. This is, uh, as we're taping this, this is the third uh, performance, third piece they've uh, performed of mine, yeah. The final concert of the uh, Houston Chamber Choir's virtual season is titled A Time to Draw Closer. And you have written, uh, as a commission, you have written a work for that concert titled The Passion of St. Cecilia. What is this piece scored for? It's for uh, choir and string quartet. And we're so fortunate to be able to collaborate here with the wonderful Apollo chamber players who have collaborated with the choir before and I've worked with them. And so it's, it's great to have kind of a big reunion here with everybody all together. And the libretto is by Charles Anthony Silvestri, who you have worked with on a number of occasions. You're, you're, you're big right. buddies, aren't you? <laughs> we are. Uh, Tony is a really terrific writer and historian and teacher and well, performer, musician, all sorts of things. Um, he is known for uh, his work with Eric Whitaker on a number of Eric's uh, best known choral pieces. Um, but he's an interesting person because he also has a strong background in history as well, his PhD is in history and he's taught history uh, for quite a while now here in Kansas. Um, so of course he brings both of those things to the table, the experience as a musician and librettist and lyricist, but also a historian. And so um, uh, I've worked with him on four operas, um, th two opera to go shows for Houston Grand Opera, um, a pastiche opera that we wrote for HGO's summer high school program that basically takes a number of beloved arias, ensemble numbers, and choruses from well-known operas, all the ones that young singers really want to sing but for reasons of their developing voice shouldn't yet. And uh, <laughs> there, this is my cat, Anya, which will, she'll make occasional entrances here. And, and Dramatic. She's very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'll see more than her tail eventually. See, so it depends on how bold she is. But yeah, we took those things. Tony um, took the melodies and wrote just wonderfully perfect um, uh, uh, new words for them, retelling the story of the Wizard of Oz. And then I wrote, I arranged the music, made it um, more appropriate for young singers, and then put a lot of connect original connecting material all between them. Uh, that premieres hopefully summer 2022 and then we wrote a 15 minute mm. opera for young singers as well so this is our first non-dramatic piece this is uh, our first choral piece as well so it's it's fun to see that side of tony his really his uh uh the the material with which he has is probably most comfortable and has done the best and what he's known for you know and what I enjoy as well. So it's it's been a fun adventure, as always. Do you remember the first collaboration with the Houston Chamber Choir? Yeah, I had written a, a setting of the Latin text O Manum Mysterium, a Christmas text, uh, one of their uh, holiday concerts there. And of course, did such a beautiful job. And um, in that space and with those singers, it was really fantastic. Before COVID, they also performed a piece of mine uh, entitled Overboard with a text by Leia Lax. Um, it had been commissioned by Houston Grand Opera for the uh, 75th anniversary of the sinking of the USS Houston in the Sunda Strait in Indonesia in World War II. Leia Lax, mm. the librettist, had written a really moving text where she set a number of uh, you know, actual words uh, from the uh, the survivors of those ships her, uh, themselves and interspersed that with what they would have seen, what they would have gone through. So it's a piece that was in three movements. The first tells the, the horror and the fear of the battle itself. Uh, and then she goes to the next chapter, uh, which is the long, one of the long forced marches that all these survivors had to do to get to the uh, internment camp. Uh, uh, and then the third uh, literally, literally just sets the names of the survivors from several of the ships, including the Australian HMAS Perth. Um, 
and then uh, she just wrote this this long movement with all their names from A to B, uh, a name for each letter of the alphabet. And I wrote mm. it so that the choir stays together in each section and sings the names, but um, heter heterophonically. In other words, they're, they're all at different times, but on the same notes. And so it sets up this undulating feel with the idea in my mind of the names becoming the sea itself and so this undulation right. becomes almost the sound of the sea and at the very end i wrote strike a bell and so for actually for a performance that houston grand opera did uh in sam houston park there downtown um turns out they have the actual bell that was from the uss houston that was recovered by divers and so it was oh. quite a moving moment when we heard the very bell itself um, ring at the very end of the piece. And so, of course, Houston Chamber Choir performed that just beautifully on a, a concert a few years ago entitled By Local, music entirely of Houston composers. Mark, as a, a composer, when you, you you sit at your piano and sit in your study, or I don't know how you, you compose, but... Yeah. <laughs> But you, you're you're working things out and you're and you're notating and uh, and then there comes a point at which you say, okay, this piece is finished. But what's it like for you to then hear it performed by a choir like the Houston Chamber Choir? Because I assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that up until that point, it's all been in your head. More or less, yeah. It's a really interesting phenomenon because we say composers write music, but that's not really the case. The composer writes a roadmap that the performers will then get. It's one of the few art forms that only exists when someone else has learned it and is performing it. I write lots of roadmaps and not all of them get performed, so, and that's fine, and that, you know, that's the way it is, but yeah, they exist in this weird sort of liminal space where they both exist and don't <laughs> so, the um relativity of composing right there um and you know technology is such that you can hear you can hear it somewhat um you can hear uh computer realizations of it and there's software now i don't have it i don't use it but there is software where the the algorithm will sing it and pronounce the words somewhat so that's mm -hmm. there and some people use that i don't just because it's expensive and i you know you hear it in your head already but composers have always had to deal with this you know listening to it and that's not it i mean that's not that unusual you go back into the 1800s and before and most people unless they lived near a very major city an artistic hub like vienna or london or paris didn't hear orchestral music all that much. So, of course, if you live in rural France or Germany uh, and happen to play the piano, may, maybe you can play a piano reduction, you know, and then maybe once or twice in your life you'll hear Beethoven's Fifth or Sixth or Tchaikovsky or, you know, whatever it is. And so to be able to hear all music at our fingertips as it was intended is a, is a really new phenomenon. So when it comes to this piece, yeah, you have this... Um, this version of the eventual piece in your mind as a composer and for a while you're the only one who has that right and then eventually you send out these midi mock-ups and a few people hear this you know poor presentation of what it will be it's kind of similar uh some uh some filmmakers use 3d modeling instead of um storyboards uh so they'll use simple 3d modeling for what the the, the movie will eventually look like and if you actually look at that right. it's, it's, it's very crude and ugly and strange and so crazy and simple compared to what you eventually get and so um it's kind of similar i feel like there's there's a similarity I storyboard it and write out the script and then someone realizes that and so it is absolutely thrilling whenever any performer takes it into their own voice or fingers or body or whatever um, and performs it and actually brings it to life for the first time um, and the added bonus when it's a when it's an ensemble as accomplished and as talented as Houston Chamber Choirs and Apollo Chamber Players 
Um, it's just the added bonus of having it sound even better than you ever could have imagined it in your head or at the keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> the commission that you have been working on and just completed for the Houston Chamber Choir is in celebration of the choir's 25th anniversary, yeah. uh, the Passion of St. Cecilia. How did that come about? Did did Robert Simpson call you up and say, hey, Mark, write us a piece? Or did he say, write us a piece and we want it to be about St. Cecilia? I mean, you know, what were the parameters that you were given for so the commission? So Bob emailed me last March, I think. So this is a little over a year ago now. Uh, and basically the former. So he told me, you know, we'd like you to write a piece for the 25th anniversary and it should be within this time span. And that's basically all. Um, and so, uh, you know, some commissioners have very specific ideas. Um, so for instance, the piece for Atlanta is supposed to be a two or three minute fanfare um, within a certain- We should mention that you're working on a, a second piece for the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. That's right. Yes. Um, and yeah. so it's in celebrations of, of, of Robert Spano's last season there. Um, and so there, you know, ex approximately what the sound is going to be, right? And you know what the, I know what the instrumentation is going to be. I know the duration. With Bob, he just said, here's a, you know, write a piece if you would for the 25th anniversary. So um, it, I, there's no sugarcoating it. It's nerve wracking. It's, it's an honor of course, to be commissioned for, you know, such a great group and for such an important event as a 25th anniversary celebration. Uh, but it is scary as well because, you know, mm -hmm. um, this is a piece that represents the 25th anniversary and the celebration, and it's got to be good, you know. Um, it's a piece that has to showcase the talent and the blend and the sound of the choir, um, because you don't want to write a piece, you know, that, you know, they're going to struggle with, not that they would ever struggle with anything. I'm convinced you could set the phone book and they would perform it beautifully. But, um, right. yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big hill at first. It's a big, you know, mountain to climb. So, um, as I was thinking about it, um, I, 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 I kind of asked myself, you know, what have composers always done? Uh, in this sort of situation. And there, there are other earlier composers who have done similar things. So St. Cecilia is the patron saint of music and of musicians, right? So singing in praise of music itself, as represented here by St. Cecilia, seemed to me like a really good way of, of celebrating the choir and of their accomplishments and of their talents as well. And so um, in the footsteps of Britain and Handel and others, uh, I decided this uh, hymn to Cecilia, whatever that looked like, would be a good avenue to pursue. So I sent Tony a message saying, are you available? He very fortunately was. And so we had a good long phone chat where we we uh, tried to figure out what direction the piece would take. Like I said before, Tony is brilliant because not only is he such a good writer, but he's a wonderful musician. And additionally, uh, he's got that really detailed knowledge of history. His dissertation was on medieval Paris, and he he spends a lot of time in Irish and English history and culture. And so um, he, what he said was, you know, there are already so many of these pieces that beatify uh, Cecilia as this larger-than-life saint. Why don't we why don't we look at her? humanity right uh humanize her a bit and so he did a deep dive into the cecilia myth uh the tradition and came up with this this passion of saint cecilia so it's in three movements and each is a, a very different takes a very different approach the the first movement uh sets the scene of course like any good storyteller would do and then tells basically the, the first half of her story from a very human point of view um and so when he sets the scene he writes these beautiful colorful words and it's just so much fun for me to just illuminate those it's almost as if he wrote this outline and i get to be the 
the animation colorist who comes in and, and does background and, and colors it all and mm. puts in maybe three dimensions. The middle movement is this very kinetic, dissonant, um, I think kind of a proto-feminist sort of thing where Cecilia uh, resists the fate that has befallen her. And so the meter is uneven. It's more of a spoken and it really lends itself to, a, again, a highly kinetic, highly energetic um, musical atmosphere. So there I get to provide a lot of contrast from that first movement in sort of a dialectical model and and have something where the, the strings really bite in and we give us a lot of that f friction with the string and the dissonance in the choir um mm -hmm. and really just explore this gnarly drama place like i said tony and i have worked so often in this dr musical dramatic space i feel like for both of us it came second nature and so boy you could almost take these three movements expand them put an opera in between and have you know a, a grand opera and then the third movement is what cecilia stands for today um uh, tony ends it with for now cecilia now you <laughs> sing through us an endless song inspiring all our art uh speaking of of what cecilia has become and what in turn this analog right of of what music is to us and it, it, the reason we we chose cecilia isn't just because of this historical um th again this analog there's also this idea of cecilia the historical person um coming up against these insurmountable odds and this really tough tribulation um situation circumstances in which she really didn't want to find herself and uh, deciding to sing to God in her heart um, as a way of both calming herself and finding a peace in these difficult circumstances. And I mean, as it so turned out, right, when, when a year ago in March, now over a year ago, 14 months ago, when, um, when Bob asked me to write this piece, it was the very beginning of the lockdown, right? choirs had been hit the hardest there were all these stories of choirs being super spreader events all of my choir and opera and singer friends were not sure about what the future was going to look like there were epidemiologists remember who said it'll be seven years until we have vaccines so look forward to being indoors for the next seven years which would have dealt really a fatal blow to so many organizations and so would there even be performances would there even be choirs at the end of the however long this was going to be was a real question we all had and so working kind of in the vacuum here um writing this piece as so many of my other premieres uh, and performances were being canceled you know is an exercise in you know, I was asking myself, is this an exercise in futility? Am I writing a piece that'll never be performed? You just never really know. So um, I wrote it knowing that something will happen with it sometime. Who knows when it'll be, but it'll be performed and who knows what it'll, what it'll look like. But with this text kind of comforting us all at the same time, right? Cecilia singing in her heart and finding the balm that exists through singing and through music was really a beautiful way for things to kind of come full circle dramatically and musically. You mentioned the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and I know that um, you, you've sort of taken strength from that in, in a bizarre sort of way um, <laughs> to write what you call the, your quarantine miniatures. That's right. So again, going back a year now, when everything was shutting down, performers were suddenly found themselves out of work, wondering what was going to happen, uh, the future of what we all do, what we've dedicated our lives to, was in question. But beyond that, um, you know, we all have this creative instinct. We all want to create. Um, performers have gifts that they that they want to share. It's not an ego thing. Mm -hmm. It's a this is what we do and you feel like you're spinning your wheels if you don't have that creative outlet and I kind of I felt the same way you know I had commissions and I had projects but we were all just sitting and and we knew there had to be more than binging Tiger King on Netflix and so <laughs> for instance you watched um, it as well <laughs> <laughs> there has to be more than life more to life than this yeah. and of course there is uh but as creative people 
we were spinning our wheels. And so I just put out a call on Facebook, um, as other composers had done, and poets and all sorts of people, saying, hey, I'd love to write pieces free of charge um, for you, for whatever instrument you have. If you're uh, in a pod with other musicians, I'll write for all of you. Um, it, it, I made a conscious decision that it had to be free of charge because I didn't, it, I'm, I wasn't trying to profit off of the difficulty. And that is something I absolutely had to stick to. Um, this wasn't meant to be any kind of exploitative thing, uh, any kind of publicity gaining thing. For, I mean, I, I tried to make very clear that these were pieces I was going to write for other people. If they chose to perform them live, great. If they chose to perform, to record it and post it, great. If they wanted to, if they, if they preferred, as some of them have chosen, to just have it be a piece where they play it personally and never put it out there, again, that's totally fine as well. It was just a way of, of communing with performers, me with the music, and then the performers with an audience if they so chose. So I was expecting maybe 40 people to, to say yes. It, uh, over 100 people ended up asking for pieces which was so much fun because it gave us all something to do. It gave us, you know, we were all exploring this new medium of virtual performances that we were kind of forced into. It, it, it was a good right. practice for that. And so there were the traditional pieces um, for solo instruments, lots for piano, lots for unaccompanied voice, and then all sorts of others. So I'm up to about 80 finished now and 20 wow. some left to go. <laughs> when going back to this idea of of being commissioned to write a piece mm -hmm. do you prefer that the commissioning entity say just write us a piece or do you prefer that they give you sort of specific parameters which do you prefer so stravinsky talked about this he said the hardest thing he had to come up against is is uh, the former when someone just asks for a piece of any length of any instrumentation. He always said that was the hardest and he always found it easiest and this is unsurprising given his background when people ask for very specific things and so you look at his very early pieces um, the ballets, Firebird, Petrushka, Rite of Spring uh, and so on where you know sometimes choreographers say I need four bars of this and then we need 16 mm -hmm. bars of this very violent thing and then two minutes of peace. That's the easiest. And it's the same for me. That's the easiest. Um, but at the same time, you do like to be able to, once something is written, explore certain sections more and not be locked in and let some things breathe more than others. And so, I don't know. Um, I like both. Of course, the quarantine miniatures were... Um, a good example of whatever uh although there were again there were very specific requests as well so i don't know i think i enjoy both um mm -hmm. i think i probably low grade panic a little bit more when it's when i have to do all of the um large scale work of figuring out the topic um and sometimes you get that from other pieces on the program so for instance my first piece with the, with the atlanta symphony um they had they had uh programmed the first act of Divakiri and the th four C interludes from Peter Grimes and so I mean I could have just and I, I had free reign to write whatever I wanted as long as it was under 10 minutes and scored for basically that size orchestra um, but I wanted it to fit in with the program and not be the redheaded stepchild over here so um, I tried to ask myself well what are some shared uh characteristics, uh, shared themes between these these two pieces, the Britain and the Wagner. Um, I thought for a minute of, of writing a 10 minute opera, uh, which would have been fun and would have worked with Valkyrie and of course Peter Grimes, which is an opera, but that's really hard to do and you have to find a librettist and that's a whole thing. Yeah, so right. mm -hmm. um, we gave up that idea. Um, but I, I looked at the characters in, in Peter Grimes, um, Ellen Orford is this, Orford is this um, the wonderful stabilizing force in the main character, Peter Grimes' life, and yet um, everyone kind of ignores her and in fact shuns her because of her association with him. In Die Valkyrie, it's two co-equal twins uh, who, spoiler alert, 
of course, Siegmund is the one who finds the sword in the tree and gets all the glory, and Sieglinda is forever forgotten and only is remembered as the mother of Siegfried. Uh, Siegfried, yes. And so, in both of these, you have kind of sidelined women. And so I asked myself, and what else in the literature features sidelined women? And I thought, oh, Hamlet with Ophelia. Um, mm. And so the end, the resulting piece is then the songs of Ophelia, in which we kind of explore her three scenes from her life so yeah um sometimes even an open-ended commission doesn't have to be open-ended it just requires a little bit of homework saying what else is on the program you know where is this going to be performed and and that can be fun too i i said it can be in it can induce a low-grade panic sometimes sure but sometimes it's fun to brainstorm and figure out what the what the topic of a piece should be I think a, a lot of people would be surprised to find out how much lead time a composer like yourself needs for a, a particular commission if you've got deadlines. How far in advance are you working? It depends on the piece. Um, I found and I, I, I work pretty quickly once I sit down and actually start writing notes. Um, the bulk of the work comes in pre-composing or pre-planning the piece, figuring out the big structure, um, and then figuring out the, uh, the tone and the theme and the topic and all that. That is what can often take months, not necessarily scoring and composing. Um, as far as how far out am I working, um, I've got a whole array of things right now. So right now I'm working on a short art song. Uh, for voice and vibraphone and then I'm going to be working on a couple two concerti actually that'll be performed I think one spring 2022 and one sometime in the 22-23 season um, and so I mean I'll finish those late summer early fall most people have a little bit more lead time and it just totally depends so I had a whole year for this um, uh, the, the Passion of St. Cecilia um, but when I got the, the libretto in, uh, late January or February sometime and then finished it in, in March. And so the text itself was the, was all that pre composition work. So once the text mm -hmm. is there, then you know what the form is going to be, you know what the emotional arc is going to be. And it's just filling in a lot of the detail. Uh, that sounds very dismissive and easy. It's not easy. It's very hard, intense daily work with hours every day, but it's, you know, it's just a question of getting in and doing the work. How did you come to music, Mark? Did you grow up in a musical family? I did. Um, my mother was always singing around the house and my dad played the trombone, uh, had played the trombone in high school and then continued to play in church. And we always had music on. Um, and so... It was musical in that regard, yeah. We we inherited, uh, when I was oh, four or five, a, a little toy piano from the neighbors, and I'm told I would sit on a little sit and spin and, and pick out melodies somehow. And so I took piano lessons for a while when I was five or six, uh, and then uh, I remember being so frustrated that I couldn't play hands together that I gave up. Uh, came back in fourth grade, to percussion and then in seventh grade returned to piano so yeah i mean so it was a musical household in that there was always music um and i just remember being captivated by music there was a cd of schumann piano music in particular that an old rca uh cd and and records that i would listen to um were sold from the library i just remember listening to and just being in, enthralled by Hindemith music for strings or, or um the uh, Turin dot symphonic Meta metamorphosis. There we go. Wow. Yeah, just kind of sitting there in a trance, thinking, how are they doing this? <laughs> how are they making this amazing sound? And when it came to applying to college, did you know at that point that you were going to be a music major? Yeah. Um, in high school, I went back and forth between journalism and music. Uh, I, I really enjoyed writing and I liked music. Um, I, at the time was, one of my jobs was uh, a delivery boy for a local newspaper, the Maryland Gazette. Um, 
There came a point where I realized, though, like I actually opened up the paper and read it. I don't know that I would enjoy covering city council meetings and that sort of thing. So more power to the people who can do that, but it just wasn't me. Um, and music had really, piano at that point had really taken over my life. And um, I decided sometime in 11th or 12th grade that this is what I was going to do. And so um, at that point, I was writing a little bit. Um, like I said, we all have the creative instinct. I was writing music mm -hmm. a little bit, but it was imitative. I was very, it was in a Philip Glass phase uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. And it just, you know, I look back at those pieces and hope they never see the light of day because it's just a lot of repeated <laughs> notes. Philip Glass can do it because he's so good at what he does. I was not. It was a lot of thirds and arpeggios. Um, and then in college, in undergrad, as I was majoring in piano, it was a sim same, similar kind of thing where, um, you know, I was, I, was, I was okay, but I wasn't the best. And you know, I was thinking, you know, if what kind of future is there for me? I was, I really liked playing the piano, but teaching piano wasn't something I wanted to do the rest of my life. And I realized that's what I, you know, I would have to do. I wasn't going to tour. Um, you know, and this was an era in which uh, availability, uh, access to all of this music was was coming in. So, of course, you know, YouTube came in toward the end of my college career. And I, I had this, these thoughts where who's going to want to listen to me play Chopin if you can click in here and literally anybody else play it? You know, 50, you can compare, you can spend the rest of your life comparing Horowitz and Rubinstein 16,000 recordings each of these same pieces by Chopin. So, I mean, I make it sound as if composing is a last resort. That's not the case. I was taking all these composition classes for fun and advanced theory classes and realizing that that's really what I enjoyed. You know, piano had been means to an end to scratch that creative itch, uh, but there was something just really fun about writing a piece seeing your name on a program and have someone else take the piece that you wrote, uh, learn it, spend all that time personalizing it, um, taking something that you'd created and putting their own personality and spin on it, uh, mm -hmm. and then getting to go to the recital and enjoying this piece that, you, that I had written and not having to get nervous <laughs> because they're nervous for you. There's just something about that that <laughs> is so addictive. And so here we are all these years later and uh, I'm awfully glad I took those classes. <laughs> Where did you do your undergraduate degree? Uh, I did undergrad at a small uh, private university in South Carolina um, as a piano major. And then uh, toward the end of my time as an undergrad, Dan Forrest, the composer, joined the faculty. Um, and I was really enjoying writing vocal and choral music at the time. Uh, as a composer, it having the text there really really helps um it it gives you a good sense of emotion and space and direction and structure uh and you get to of, of, you get to illuminate that and so studying with dan was kind of a no-brainer so i stayed on there and uh got a master's and studied with dan and dan was really good because he he talks so much about number one the craft of composition uh the very the specific the nitty-gritty of writing for choir and writing for voice but also the bigger picture of philosophical things, one thing he always talked about and still does talk about is uh, the composer's job of either fulfilling the expectations of both the performers and the audience or subverting it somehow. And that's how you create the musical mm -hmm. tension in that space in between those, between fulfillment and subversion. Um, and so that really started me down the path of, of composition as a craft and not this kind of loosey-goosey inspiration you know um <laughs> the cabinetry of of composition right you did your dma your doctor of musical arts at university of houston that's right um so i went back to maryland after the masters spent a year teaching piano and odds and ends composing a little bit too i went to a festival in italy a really wonderful festival that um in what is a challenging time for so many people that age um I was really fortunate to have a number of uh, these instances come up that 
did drive home that this was what I was supposed to be doing. Um, I'd, I'd won a competition as well, a choral competition. So, um, and so, yeah, so I applied to a number of programs, made it into a few, and then decided on the University of Houston because, number one, it's a great program. And then, number two, because it was in Houston. Um, Houston is a really terrific place for so many of the arts because there is a certain degree of philanthropy. And because Houston... Um, Houston musicians and artists are scrappy people who make stuff happen. So as compared to a number of other cities where there's a very strong top-down establishment where everything happens through one way, that's kind of the direction, right? Because there are certain gatekeepers mm -hmm. and the only way you make it into this scene is by doing one of these things. That's not to say that major cities outside of Houston don't have people who chart their own paths. But in Houston, the people who forge their own path, um, I think, I think there are more of us who, more people who do that in Houston. Uh, like I said, people are scrappy and find ways of making things happen. And so you've got performances at the silos at Sawyer Yards, um, in the cistern at Buffalo Bayou, at all sorts of things. Musica did a, a series of brass fanfares at the Clock Tower across from Market Square Park. I mean, all of these things. Um, Opera to go, you know, Houston Grand Opera, with the most robust and busiest opera education program really in the world, where, you know, the second opera they commissioned from me, they performed 120 times, you know, tens of thousands of kids saw these operas, and nowhere else in the world is a composer going to have opportunities like this, and so, yeah, so I came down here in 2011, uh, finished the degree in 2015, the dissertation and all that, and I always say Houston is like a magnet for musicians. You know, you move here and then thinking you're only going to be here for a few years and then a decade goes by and I'm still here. <laughs> and gladly so. Have you ever written your own libretto? No. Uh, I don't trust myself for that. Many people do with varying degrees of success. Uh, and there are famous examples of people who have, of course, Boito uh, wrote so many wonderful libretti in the 1800s, and then he was a composer as well, so wrote his own Mephistopheles. Um, Wagner. Have, what's that? Wagner. Wagner. Mm -hmm. He very <laughs> much wrote his own. <laughs> and then wrote tomes about how brilliant he was to have written his own. Mm -hmm. um, Carlisle Floyd writes his own libretti and does an amazing job. Uh, with that um, I don't know I don't I just don't trust myself to I feel like I would write stuff that would be too flowery and too self-conscious um, I don't know I've thought about it so many times and it would on the one hand it would make things easier because there would be a degree of flexibility um, but on the other hand I would miss out on some really terrific collaborations I've been so fortunate to have worked with Tony on these pieces and to be able to write these just d d pieces on these delightful libretti that he's written um, and hilarious he's he's got a, a comedic bone that it is just who would have known um, with Leia Lax I mean I've been able to work with her first of all on on Overboard the piece for Houston Grand Opera but then uh, we've we're, we're currently working together on a 45 minute mass in exile for chorus and orchestra I'm glad that I don't write my own libretti because I get to work with so many brilliant people who bring a wealth of experience and vocabulary and knowledge and dramatic sense that I don't necessarily have. And in collaborating with these people, you get this really interesting third, almost persona, the collaboration itself mm. that creates these things that I wouldn't have been able to do on my own. You're still a young man. Thank you. <laughs> what are your <laughs> what compositional goals do you have? Is there, you know, I I want to write before I die. Oh man, so many things, Sinjin. Um, I really want to write more large scale, medium and large scale symphonic pieces. I've been really fortunate to write a number of pieces for orchestra that have been concerti or pieces for soloist and orchestra. Um, a number of pieces for chamber orchestra that I've loved. I've, I've worked several times now with Rocco, um, and it's so much fun. Um, and then that's some... the River Oaks Chamber Orchestra. That's right. Yeah, 
here in Houston. Um, and then some bigger orchestral things. Again, others concerto or shorter pieces. But I do want to um, explore that, you know, 10 to 30 minute range uh, for pieces. Um, it's purely impractical, especially given the economics of music right now, but um, further pieces for soloist, choir, and orchestra, those don't get performed very much, but it is such a, I mean, there's a reason so many um, British composers in the late 19th century wrote these in, these huge pieces for those forces. Unfortunately, again, mm -hmm. given the economics, these Perry and Stanford pieces aren't performed all that often, but they're, they're so much fun. Um, and then large-scale grand opera uh we've again this is kind of the pitch phase like i talked about but i've written these four uh one act operas with tony um that all have been aimed at younger audiences and so i do really want to sink my teeth into again a large-scale dramatic piece that doesn't necessarily mean dark and dramatic it, i mean i really enjoy writing comedic things whether it's song cycle or or keep or, or instrumental but, you know, a, a larger scale dramatic opera would be an awful lot of fun. Do you sit and look at the list of works that you've created and, and think, okay, I need to beef up this particular area. I need, I need uh, more orchestral works. I need more concerti. Or do you not really think about it in those terms? Not in those terms. Um, well, I, I mean, I need to write more for for choir um, because I've so enjoyed it, and the things I've written have have done pretty well. Um, so I, I would enjoy beefing up that bit of my catalog for sure. Um, I've written you know over a hundred art songs, um, and so with things like that, with the string quartets, uh, I just I wrote a fifth string quartet that's being premiered sometime before too long. Um, for me, um, the next step is not thinking a lot about uh, what do I need to write it's what do I do with this large catalog of pieces that I have written um, mm. and that's difficult because the publishing world um, is a challenge it's it's right. an oversaturated market right um, I'd love to do some recording projects but of course that is such an expensive undertaking so you know it's it's figuring out what to do with the catalog right now that's the question I, you know I could do I could do five or six CDs of art song. I don't know that the world needs five or six CDs of my art songs, but you know, <laughs> getting one or two out there would be fun. Similarly with the chamber music, I'd love to get the string quartets on record. Um, some of the choral stuff as well. I'd love to get a recording done of that. So, you know, that's that's sort of, I'm putting out feelers for both of those things, both publishing and recording. Um, you know, and just seeing what comes next with those. Do you sleep with a a book of, of music staff paper next to your bed and a pencil and you wake no. up in the middle of the night and jot, jot down an idea? Fortunately, music doesn't invade my dreams. And when it's there, it's, uh, it's someone else's piece, which I'm more than happy with. Um, every now and then I'll have an idea for something. So I'll just... I, I <laughs> this is how the sausage is made. I I start a draft of an email to myself and let it sit there and you know forget it because a better idea comes along. So I've got a whole folder of drafts of mm -hmm. oh you should start with a you know a pulsing string motive that the winds go over and the brass punctuate with percussion, you know. And so sometimes that makes its way into a piece and sometimes not. But I've, regardless, I've got a folder of these you know half lucid misspelled ideas that I wrote without my glasses at 2 a.m. Hey, that'll, that'll sit there and some musicologist someday will scratch their head over. <laughs> Finally, Mark, you are on a desert island and you can take the musical work of one composer with you. Who would that be? I don't know if that's a, a fair question, but... Uh, Oh, Do you man. have a composer that just, you know, you couldn't live without? Oh, all of them. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
and it would change depending on the day. Uh, John C. Adams. His music, I think, is a good desert island library because he has what he calls the naive and the sentimental, the the minimalist side, the silly side, the fun side, and also the very dour, modernist, complicated side. And so as I was on a desert island, either despairing or at peace, you know, there's music for both of those. And it's also colorful and deep, and there's so many great things. Um, or Bach, if I could bring with me the complete works of Bach, I think um, there's so much depth there and perfect proportions in every piece he wrote. Um, you get the drama of the St. Matthew Passion and you get the dancing qualities of the Brandenburg and Charity and the incredible honesty of all the cantatas and uh, the perfect counterpoint of all the organ music. I mean, that's a little bit of a cop-out because it's a few more CDs than Adams, so it keeps it keeps me busier on the island for a little bit, but <laughs> one of those. Probably one of those. Mark, it's been great to talk to you, and congratulations on The Passion of St. Cecilia. Uh, to, congratulations <laughs> to you and to Tony as well. We look forward to... Uh, potentially more collaborations between you and the, and the Houston Chamber Choir in the future. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking time to talk. Thank you very much for having me, Sinjin. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you to everybody who supports the Houston Chamber Choir as a patron, as a supporter, as an audience member. We couldn't do what we do without your support. Thank you very much. I'm Sinjin Flynn. This is Behind the Music. Join us again next time. The Houston Chamber Choirs with One Accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. As a 501c3 nonprofit, support from listeners like you allows us to continue making new and exciting programming. For more information about us and how you can support our work, please visit HoustonChamberChoir.org give.